Let's open our Bibles now, please, to the book of John, chapter 12. The book of John, chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that he might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. In this passage of Scripture, we have three really very, very important facts, three very important things that I want to call your attention to today. And uh, when you leave the service, I want you to be able to remember these three things. The first one of those things is this, that uh, Simon the leper, the one who had been cleansed of leprosy, is the one who had this, uh, this feast for Jesus, you compare with Matthew and Mark, and then you read this, and you find out that Lazarus was living with Mary and Martha in the city of Bethany, but so was Simon the leper. And Jesus had healed this man of leprosy, and he was calling this feast together at his house, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus went over there to that house, and many people gathered together. All of the disciples were there, and this feast was in honor of Jesus. Remember the honor to the Son of God. He was giving a feast in honor of the one who had cleansed him from leprosy. Now, in the Bible, leprosy is a type of sin. As you read it throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, anytime you see leprosy, it's a type of sin because that sin is inward and then it breaks out into the flesh. And sin is like that. Sin is in the heart of man and out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And Jesus said, out of the heart comes all manner of evil and wickedness and vileness and corruption and murder. All of these things come out of the heart of man. And here's a man who had leprosy but had was cleansed. He was totally made well. And so he was having a feast to honor Jesus and to say, thank you for healing me. I, I wonder if any of us who've been cleansed from our sins, the Bible says that Jesus loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I wonder if we have the spirit of thanksgiving and honor to the Son of God like we ought to have. I mean, you know, sometimes we come together on Sunday and we honor him and we're saying, oh, how I love Jesus. But I wonder, do we do it on Monday and Tuesday? Do we do it throughout the week? Do we honor the Son of God the way we really ought to? This is probably the first opportunity that Simon had had to have a feast in honor of Jesus. And I think he wanted to put it on right. I think he wanted to do it just absolutely, do it up in the very finest way. And, and so he invites Martha over. Now Martha was known to be a good cook and one who uh, was always serving. She was serving. You know, I could just picture her. She, she's one of these busy kind of people in the kitchen. And she's working and working. And so when Simon said, we're going to honor Jesus, and Jesus probably had been staying at their house. 
Uh, you know, six days before Jesus was going to be offered as a Passover lamb, he comes to Bethany. But this feast is about two days before uh, the actual uh, Passover. And so Jesus has been staying over with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they've been invited to come over and have this great feast. And Simon is saying, man, I want to put this on right. This is honor to Jesus. We're giving him thanksgiving. He has cleansed me, and I stand as one cleansed from leprosy, and I want to honor him, and I'm going to give him thanks. And so he said, Martha, get your crock pot and get that, well, get your, uh, uh, get your feast in, get it, put that beef roast in there, and get everything together. And, uh, and then here comes Lazarus. Uh, he's carrying a pot of green beans, and, and, uh, and Mary's coming over. She's got all the biscuits, and they're bringing everything together, and they're having this great big feast at the house of Simon the leper to say, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. Oh, how we ought to be thankful how we ought to sing, uh, count your blessings, name them one by one. Be thankful to God for all that he has done for you. How good God has been to us and how good our Savior that we are cleansed from sin and we have his gift of eternal life. We have a home in heaven. All is well for the child of God. And so, the first thing I want you to remember is to honor Jesus. Honor him with thanksgiving. Honor him with praise. And bring others around and tell others about how good Jesus is. I better call your attention to another person here, and that's Mary. Now, Mary is one of those people who is known always to be worshiping. She's chosen the more necessary part. And here Mary comes, and she has a box, a pound of ointment, spikenard, of which was an ointment that they imported from East India. Very costly, very expensive. In fact, when Judas starts talking about it, he said it was worth over 200 pennies. Now, in that language, watch this. The workers would work a day and would be paid a penny a day. That was their wages. And so this represented a year's wages. Consider it. Here's 300 pennies. You take 300 days a year, and then you take uh, the, every Sabbath day, 52 more days, and then the feast days, you have 365 days this represents a whole year's wages. Mary probably herself has gone out and gathered the gleanings of the harvest. She's been one out there who's worked in the vineyard, and she's saved her money, and she has purchased this tremendously expensive nard, representing a year's wages. She's going to pour it all out on Jesus. Now, if you consider in our day, uh, if a person made $15 an hour and uh, they worked 300 days, they would have over $30,000. That's, uh, re that's what this represents. And here's one who brings it all and gives it to Jesus. What worship there is in the heart of this woman. And not only does she take the ointment, and she opens it up, breaks the seal. She pours it on his head, Matthew and Mark say, and anoint his head. And then she goes down and anoints his feet and kisses his feet. And then, in those days, the ladies wore their hair long, and they kind of parted it in the middle, and they would bring the hair over top of their shoulders and would be down the front. And she bowed down, and she bows at the feet of Jesus, in humility, in worship, in thanksgiving, opening her heart to the Son of God, and she anoints his feet and then dries it with the hairs of her head. She gives all. Years ago, in some of the Baptist churches, they used to have what they call 
Paycheck Sunday. And in some of the places, they would ask their people to bring their paycheck for one week and give that as an offering to Jesus. One paycheck. I never did do that in any of the church I ever pastored. I, I just didn't feel quite right about it. I mean, it's okay. It was okay. Brother Troy probably did it twice a year. I mean, I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, it was okay. But what if you ask for a year's wages? Who would do it? Who would do that? And yet here is a woman who gives it all to Jesus. You can't give Jesus too much. You can't give him too much honor. You cannot give him enough praise. You cannot give him enough love. You just can't. And you can give honor like Simon did, but you can give genuine heartfelt worship like Mary did. Where are you in your relationship to Christ? Where are you? Are you just honoring him or are you giving him your all? After all he's done for me, after all he's done for me, how can I do less than give him my best and live for him completely? After all he's done for me. He has purchased our souls. He has forgiven our sin. He's given us everlasting life. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Word of God to direct us. He's given us the privilege to pray and receive from Him. And He's given us the hope of eternal glory. How can we do less than honor Him and praise Him and then worship Him? It seems like many people today are afraid of giving Jesus too much. You can't. You can't honor him too much. I mean, some people look at me cross-eyed when I say, well, I think you ought to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Oh, I can't do that. I, 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 don't, I don't worship that much. I'm not that concerned about learning the things of God. You can't give Jesus too much. Folk, I, I'm not criticizing and I'm not scolding you. I'm just saying I want you to ask yourself, where do you fit in this business of worshiping Jesus? Is he important to you or is he a sidelight to you? Where is he in your life? To Mary, he was everything. He was all in all. And so it ought to be with each one of us. We ought to give him everything. We ought to worship him and honor him and praise him and not even ask the cost. Here she is in humility, bowing down at his feet, taking the place of a lowly servant, honoring Jesus, weeping and anointing his feet and then drying his feet with her hairs. Do you know what happened as a result of that? You know what happens when you put Jesus first? When he's more important to you uh, than anything else that you could ever have happen in your life? When he's more important to you than any TV program or any activity that you could ever involve yourself in? He's more important than the easy chair? He's more important to you than anything. When that happens, something wonderful happens. Look what happened here. The scripture said... But the whole room was filled with the odor of the ointment. You know what? It's a sweet thing to worship Jesus. It's a sweet thing when you place, make him first in your life. And what happens is the odor of that fills everything around you. And it's a sweet smell in the monsters of God himself. Oh, think of how good that is to give Jesus his rightful place in your life. He ought to be first. He ought to be first. He ought to be the most important person in your life. He deserves that. The scripture said he's worthy. 
in the picture of heaven when we see heaven in the book of Revelations chapter uh, 4 and 5 we see some wonderful things there and we see all of the angels of glory the seraphim the cherubim all of the living creatures all bowing down and saying worthy is the lamb that was slain oh worthy is him he is worthy of honor and dominion and power and a kingdom and all of the worship of all creatures everywhere Glory be to him who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, who is the Savior of all who will trust in him. He's worthy. He's worthy of first place in your life. He's worthy of first place in your life. Amen. And that's exactly where you ought to make him. First place. You ought to put him on the throne of your heart. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter said, you know, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That means put him on the very throne of your heart. Put him in the very first place in your heart. Worship him. Bow down before him. Give him his rightful glory. And she gave all. In, in the past week, we had Memorial Day, and there was a statement that was made many, many times. You heard it over. And it said, all gave some, but some gave all. And on Memorial Day, we recognize those who gave all. I want to tell you, Jesus gave it all. Jesus did not hold back any single thing. He gave all for us. He gave all for you. Everything for you. He gave all for you. And now he's saying, Will you worship me? Will you make me the king, the Lord of your life? He's worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise. And when that happens, all the room will be filled with the odor of the ointment. Ah, that sweet smell of worship to Jesus. But then you notice there is a Judas spirit, a spirit that happens, and, uh, and here... We have somebody who was cruci crucifying her in their feelings and criticizing her and putting her down because she made Jesus first. Because Jesus was more important to her than money. Jesus was more important to her than the praise of men. Jesus was the most important. She said, he's Lord. And I worship him. And Judas says, well, why wasn't this ointment so?" Well, for 300 pence, and we could have given that money to the poor. <laughs> By the way, any time you want to surrender to Jesus and make Jesus first place in your life, there will be some Judases that are going to criticize you for it. It always happens. And there are going to be some who will say, well, why are you doing so much? Don't you know that you ought to let others do more? Why are you going to church so often? Are you afraid the doors will close because you're not there? What's wrong? And these old critics will be there and they'll criticize you. If you love Jesus, you're going to catch it in the neck. If you put him first, you're going to get it. And here, Jesus lets it be known why he said what he did. It was not that he cared for the poor. When people criticize you for living for Jesus and making Jesus the king of your life, making him the Lord of all in your life, some will criticize you. And the reason they're criticized you is not because they're against what you've done. It's because it makes them look bad. Because they don't have that dedication. They don't have that love. They don't have that sacrificial attitude toward Jesus. And so they're going to criticize you to put you down to their level. But watch what happened. The scripture said... He said that not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he was the treasurer. He's the one that carried the bag. And so he wanted that money put in there so he could steal some more out of it. He's been stealing from the apostles for three years. He's a thief. And so he was concerned that the money was in the bank under his control. 
Uh, by the way, you know the scriptures teach if, if you give anything to God, whether you're giving to the building program or to missions or the general fund or whether you're giving to special offerings, whether you're giving to evangelists or whatever, the moment you put that in, that belongs to God. Amen. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the, to the Lord. And we look at that money and we say, this is God's money. We're dealing with the Lord's work here. And it's very important that we look at it that way. Years ago, I had a lady that came to my church and she said, uh, for the school, I want to dedicate this freezer. Well, I said, well, how nice. That is wonderful. We could use that freezer there. We had a daycare and we had uh, the kindergarten and then the school. And so we could use it. So she had it delivered. It was very nice and put in there. And over a period of time, she got angry with me. Now, I can't ever understand why anybody would get angry with me. <laughs> Just such a lovable person as I am. But she did. And she got cross. And so she came to me and she said, I'm going to get my, I'm going to pick up my freezer. And I said to her, I didn't know you had a freezer here. <laughs> she said, what? I said, I thought you gave that to God. You said you did. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to let you have it. Because if I do, I'm taking God's material and giving it to you, a woman that's got bitterness in her heart. Woo! <laughs> I was a little more bold back in those days. Nowadays, I would have said it different. I would have said, you're not getting it because you'd be stealing from God. Oh. I want to tell you something. When you put it in the offering, it belongs to him. And we feel responsible for that. In this church, we watch every penny. And, uh, and we have some people kid me a little bit, said, Abraham Lincoln weeps. <laughs> You hold on to those pennies. We watch, watch what we do here. We want to use it all for the glory of God. I want to say something to you here. And I want you to get this. Don't ever be a Judas. Don't ever question if somebody loves Jesus and want to put Jesus first and honor him and worship him. Encourage them. Don't criticize them. Encourage them. And tell them that's a great thing to love Jesus. It's a great thing to give your life to Jesus. You ought to stand for the Lord and be an encourager of people who put Jesus first in their lives because you don't want to be a Judas. No, you really don't. Now, the Scripture said here, Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. It doesn't matter whether it's the Great Society or the new program or the New Deal or whatever programs these uh, different uh, politicians come up with. The poor are always going to be there. Jesus said it. You cannot eliminate poverty. Uh, the uh, great uh, teaching back in the uh, late 60s was that we're going to eliminate poverty in one generation. <laughs> At the end of the generation, we had more poverty than we ever thought about before. You're not going to eliminate it by throwing money at it. That's just a reality, folks. Just take Jesus at his word, the poor you'll have with you always. But I want you to notice what he said right before that. Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. And now, Jesus had told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem, was going to be betrayed in the hands of sinners, that the chief priests and Pharisees would turn him over to the Romans, that they would condemn him to death, they would crucify him. He had already told them this. He told them he was going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. They, everyone, missed it. Do you ever sometimes feel like you might have missed it sometimes, some spiritual truth, and it might have evaded you? Don't be alarmed. These disciples walked with him three years, and they still missed it. Every one of them missed it, except Mary. Mary anointed Jesus in view of his burying. She took him at his word. She believed what he said was true, that he was going to be crucified and would need to be buried. And so she took care of that. You've got to give her credit. You know what she was doing? She was looking ahead. 
She was preparing for the future. Watch this. When you give to God, that's exactly what you're doing. The Bible says in the words of Jesus, Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. But rather, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and thieves break not through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. You know what he's saying? When you lay treasure down here to the kingdom of God, you're laying up treasure in heaven, and the Lord's marking it down in his book, and you're going to be rewarded for that in the future. You see, you need to have the same long-range view that Mary had. Mary said, the rest of them are feasting. I'm preparing for the burial. And you, people, people around you, are living for what they can get out of life. They're going to lay up treasure here, and they think their life consists in the abundance of the things they have. But Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven. You're wise because you're going to be there forever. Here a short time, there forever. Amen. Lay up treasure in heaven. Be rich toward God. And that's exactly what Mary was doing. So, are you just one who honors the Lord? Or are you one who worships Him and puts Him first in your life? Now, there's one other thought here. And that is, I want you to notice Lazarus. Now, Lazarus went over to the meal, and he sat down at the uh, table. And, you know, the tables were very low in those days, and they laid on them, reclined with their feet out. And, and so that's where they went all around the table. They didn't sit with their feet under the table like we do today, but it was out from it, and they laid on their side, reclining, and their feet were out that way. And here's Lazarus sitting with Jesus. You've got to admire him. Boy, I would love to have been there, wouldn't you? To sit at the table with Jesus? My, and Lazarus was there. But I want you to notice what it says about Lazarus. It said that the people, much people, verse 9, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Did you see why they came? They wanted to see Jesus, but they also wanted to see Lazarus. Now, the Scripture said, because, verse 11, that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. What a testimony. Now, our Savior is going back to glory, and we don't see him, but yet believing we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory knowing one day we're going to see him and the world now cannot see him but the world still is crying show me Jesus and you know what happens they see Jesus in a life that's changed here was a man who was dead and now he's alive he's there he is buried he's dead four days scripture said he even stunk He's in bad way. Jesus comes, restores his life, gives him life. Now, people want to see that. Now, I'd like to see that too. Now, think about this. The world today wants to see what the Lord is doing in your life. That's your testimony. That's why they came. They wanted to see Lazarus because of what he had experienced from Jesus. Does the world around you see what the Lord has done for you? Can the world look at you and say, boy, he's changed. He's different. He's different in his speech. His speech is being cleaned up. He's not like he used to be. You know, his attitude is totally different. He used to have a mean attitude. Now he's got a sweet and a kind attitude and he's kind toward others and more caring than he's ever been. His life has changed. He doesn't do the things he used to do. He's been with Jesus. That's what they said about the early apostles, remember? They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus and learned of him. You see, the world today 
Although they can't see Jesus, they see what Jesus does in our lives. He sees what Jesus has done for you. How he's called you out of darkness into light, out of death into life, out of sin into a life of godliness and righteousness. Do you see it? Folk, listen. The world needs to see Jesus in you. They need to see what Jesus has done in your life. May your life shine for Jesus. Jesus said it, let your light so shine before men that they may behold your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They want to see it. The world is not moved by our words if it's not backed up by our life. You've heard me use the little funny expression, let your walk and your talk agree. For your talk walks and your walk talks, but your walk talks further than your talk walks. Now you put all that together, and what that simply says is, yeah, what that says is, if your life doesn't back it up, they're not going to listen to what you say. The world wants to see Jesus and what he's done in you. Are they seeing that in your attitude? Are they seeing that in your spirit? Are they seeing that? You go out to a restaurant and the waitress spills coffee on you. And instead of getting all angry and mean, you let the love of God shed forth in you. And you say, it's all right. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And you clean it up. You don't, uh, if they bring you the wrong thing, you don't get angry and spout off like an evil, wicked sinner does. But instead, you have the love of God. And you see, it's okay. It'll be okay. We'll just change. All is well. Somebody cuts you off in a car, and you simply say, they must be in a hurry. Maybe they're going to the hospital. It's okay. You simply do not stay like a wicked sinner stays, and you don't live like they live. Your life is changed. What a difference it made when the Lord came and stayed in my heart. Oh yes, I've been changed. That's what happened with Lazarus. How much more change can you get from dead to alive? How much more change can you get in your life from what you used to be walking with the world, this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience? But now you've been made alive and the life also of Christ lives in you. What a difference it makes. Do you get it? You represent him. I want you to see the words. Honor. Yes, you ought to honor the Lord and give him thanks. Worship. Yes, you ought to make him first in your life. Worship him. Let him, him be the God of your life. The reason you get up in the morning. The reason you do what you do, let it be Jesus. And now, represent him to everybody around you. Let's pray together.